Omicron peaking. And Omicron peaking in January 2022. So relief finally came in December 2020 when both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines got emergency authorization from the FDA. So there have been almost a half a billion cases of COVID worldwide since the start of the pandemic and over 6.2 million deaths. In the United States, the death rate increased by 16% between 2019 and 2020, almost completely attributed to the pandemic. However, there have been inconsistencies in how the data is collected, including outbreaks and patient outcomes. So the public health system has been underfunded for many years and the pandemic put an extra burden on the on workers jobs to complete reporting with the decreased resources some states felt that their limited resources were best used to inform potential exposures and prevent community spread instead of actually sending in their reports and others noted that the information needed to be transmitted manually since the systems wouldn't communicate with each other and some states were even accused of withholding data to downplay the pandemic. So overall, the number of cases and deaths is likely significantly higher than what is being reported on this data. So in addition to the symptoms of like fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, and muscle or body aches, and a loss of taste and smell about two to 14 days after exposure, Many of the patients are reporting continued symptoms lasting for weeks or months after the infection. And COVID has an effect on almost every body system. A friend who is an ER nurse noted seeing AFib, small bowel obstructions, and cardiac and respiratory deficiencies in previously healthy patients after the infection. And reports have also shown organ damage to the lungs, heart, kidney, and brain, in addition to increased clotting causing heart attacks and strokes. Systemic disparities have been present in our healthcare system forever, but they're, they were exacerbated during the pandemic and overall non-elderly Black, Hispanic, or American Indian Alaskan Native populations are more likely to report that their health is, being, um, is fair or poor. So due to the high rate of underlying conditions, communities of color are more likely to have a serious illness if they are infected with COVID and have worse health outcomes compared to their white counterparts. According to the World Health Organization, during the first year of the pandemic, the global prevalence of depression and anxiety increased by 25%. And this is likely due to the uncertainty of the state of the world at the time, and there was no end in sight. And loneliness during lockdowns, fear of infection, suffering and death, of those close to us and grief and financial worries were all cited as stressors leading to anxiety and depression. And with stay-at-home mandates and the slow, uh, with stay-at-home mandates to slow the spread, many patients were unable to see a therapist in face-to-face -face meetings. And there's also a stigma against mental health problems in many minority communities. So they also did not see healthcare professionals and there are just problems accessing care. And although the suicide rate continued a downward trend of like 3% from 2019, the suicide prevention hotline noted an 800% increase in calls. And there are also a record increase in the homicide rate in the country. Um, a study done by the University of Michigan showed that 21% of patients noted an incident of discrimination during a healthcare visit. And while race was a leading cause, education, income, weight, sex, age, and health status were also reported. There is systemic discrimination in our current healthcare system, which is exacerbated during the pandemic, since there are fewer resources available for minority populations and many people receive a lower level of care than what is given to white patients. Um, some providers may withhold pain medication after a judgment that a patient is drug seeking based on their race and country of origin is also a factor in discrimination as providers without cultural competencies and understanding may judge a patient at, or not have the needed resources available, such as a translator. 
Even outside of a clinical setting, many minorities, especially males, refuse to wear a mask for fear of looking menacing or gang affiliated. Early in the pandemic, there were several instances where patients received better care than others. Um, when PPE was in short supply, hospitals wasted funding trying to outbid each other for protecting their staff and higher income individuals and those with connections were also given exclusive access to PPE um, when the mask mandate started. When ventilators were in short supply, older patients were removed due to a low survivability and given to younger patients. When hospitals were overflowing and care was rationed, younger patients and those with less underlying conditions were given preferential treatment as they had the best chance of recovery. And when vaccines were released, many high income patients gave significant donations to have exclusive access before the rest of the public because they felt enabled to get better care and were able to afford the higher price. So many minorities have little trust in the healthcare system due to previous instances of racial, racial discrimination. The Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in African-American males is an example of how the healthcare system failed those in need. And due to the history of pain and suffering, minorities may defer care until it's too late, causing poor health outcomes and increased distrust of the healthcare system. Although anti-vaxxers are not a new concept, there has been a significant increase in the following. And what used to be a fringe ideology has turned mainstream, likely due to the vaccination mandates. Minorities were previously reluctant to get vaccinations due to distrust in medical professionals, but this movement has increased the ratio of unvaccinated minorities. And an OBGYN I spoke with noted that some providers are refusing to accept unvaccinated patients further just decreasing their access to healthcare. It is also more than the COVID vaccine that's causing hesitancy. She has seen an increase in mothers refusing third trimester vaccines and an increase in cases of whooping cough, which can be fatal to infants. So by June, 2020, it was estimated that around 10% of the pre-pandemic workforce was laid off which is around 7.7 .7 million people. And this also affected 6.9 million of their dependents who also lost their coverage. Without jobs, they were unlikely to have the money to pay out of pocket for healthcare costs and, or to continue coverage with COBRA. And communities of color had the highest rate of being uninsured and faced problems accessing care. The United States system is also really complex and difficult to navigate even for those with higher education and working in the healthcare industry and these nuances to every coverage. So it was unclear of what services were covered. Nearly one in 10 American adults had significant medical debt and it is estimated that almost $200 billion is owed. Many living on the edge of poverty will also defer care due to a choice of copay or their next meal. Uh, Blacks, Hispanics, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders were more likely to report going without care due to costs. And all besides Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders also reported delaying care for reasons outside of cost. And with the stay-at-home mandates, many providers change their office visits to telehealth visits. So low-income um, low and transient populations had difficulty managing these appointments due to unrest unreliable phones and inconsistent internet access. Preventative medicine appointments have also put a burden on the system. Many screening tests were canceled due to shifting healthcare workers to helping COVID patients. Patient, uh, screening tests are necessary for early detection, early treatment, and improving a patient's prognosis. Colonoscopies and mammograms were delayed during the pandemic, leading to later diagnoses and poor health outcomes. Elective surgeries were also canceled due to increased need for beds of COVID patients, and this led to increased pain and suffering by the patients while they waited for their corrective surgeries. And surgeries and other treatments were also delayed if a patient tested positive, reducing the chance of a full recovery. A friend working at a physical therapy clinic noted that 
the office had a strict 10 day symptom free policy and no option for telehealth. So many treatments were rescheduled and delayed. And an ER nurse that I talked to noted that patients have delayed care almost to the point of no return due to the idea that hospitals are overrun and other stressors in their life had prevented them from coming in. So she noted that patients feel like someone else deserves a bed more than they do and they don't come in until their body is essentially shutting down. Um, so government agencies such as the Department of Health and Human Services had difficulty getting patients the needed benefits. They had to close some of their offices and they moved lots of their workers to remote work. So there was an avenue of access removed for the vulnerable people. And there was also an increased volume compounded with a large backlog of claims leading to delayed distribution of benefits. So case managers were unable to visit their patients and low staffing opened the doors for negligence and people being left behind and unable to get the care that they needed. Many systemic racial disparities cause, um, or they led to occupational disparities during the pandemic. And educational attainment is lower in racial minorities, which cause a higher rate of them to work in service industries. Nearly a quarter of Black and Hispanic people are essential workers and employed in the service industry as compared to white people, which is 16% versus 24%. And due to being frontline workers and their inability to work from home, these populations had an increased risk of contracting COVID and they have lower wages and many live on the edge of poverty. So it was not an option to take a day off of work to get tested or be sick because of the potential loss of income and reflecting on their more limited incomes prior to COVID-19 groups of color were more likely than whites to report a range of financial concerns, including being or very or moderately worried about paying monthly bills, rent, mortgage, and other housing costs, and minimum payments on credit cards. And it was also noted that they were more likely to experience food insecurity due to not having a job or having a low paying job. And lower income people typically live in urban environments where the population density is greater and the transmission of COVID is high. Transmission was lowest in rural areas as there was space for each person to be socially distanced. And additionally, they live in houses with many other people such as multi-generational living situations. And due to this, there's a higher risk of infection because of the wider network of people with, that a housemate would encounter. And there is less social distancing in a home also due to the amount of people living in a small area. So millions of people lost their job during the pandemic and they also lost their home because they were unable to pay for their rent or mortgage and the homeless population is exploded, especially in urban areas. However, many shelters were forced to reduce their capacity leading to more people living on the street and public facilities were closed leading to unsanitary living conditions. And there are fewer resources available. So connecting those around you or connecting with those around you could increase your survivability, but also increase your risk of contracting COVID. Additionally, as mentioned earlier, homeless people rarely had consistent access to phones or computers for video call healthcare visits. Due to the increased stress during the pandemic, many people turned to drugs while cocaine and heroin continued to be in high use, newer, more potent drugs such as fentanyl have also entered the market. Fentanyl is occasionally combined with other drugs and only a small amount can be fatal. In the year ending in November, 2020, there is nearly a 30% increase in drug overdoses, primarily due to fentanyl. In addition to stress, isolation can also cause an increase in drug overdoses as you will not have someone there to save you and if something does go wrong. And there is a stigma against drug use and many people don't wanna admit that they're addicted and need professional help. So they just are, there are more barriers to care. Um, and I talked to a nurse who said that 
although the city can uh, contracts with provided accommodations such as treatment counseling and group therapy to addiction patients, the process was difficult and lengthy and due to lifestyle and the lifestyle of a substance abuser, a two to three week application process and COVID testing and isolation made follow through unlikely. So out of the more than two dozen patients that she referred, only about a third entered treatment. The first major COVID outbreak was at a care home in Washington where 129 people were infected, including patients, caregivers, and visitors. And at the end of this outbreak, um, 23 people ended up dying from COVID. So older populations were at a higher risk for severe complications if they contracted the virus and care homes were conducive for quick spreading of the virus. Uh, but Facilities were put on lockdown and many of the patients experienced a mental decline due to feeling isolated and having decreased interactions. And for me, my grandpa's 99th birthday was actually the week that lockdown started. So we weren't able to see him and he just felt alone. But luckily, he got his vaccine early and he's doing good. So we just celebrated his 101st birthday. And they said they also noted that many families had to give end of life goodbyes over video conferencing due to the visitor policies at care homes. And children in Child Protective Services and Child welfare are already vulnerable and struggling populations due to the separation from their families. And minorities are seen at a higher rate in the child welfare and foster systems than white children. There is an increased strain on visits during the pandemic due to prevention protocols and limited public spaces due to lockdowns. Visits were shorter due to the more time needed to sanitize rooms and uh, parents couldn't share a meal with their child due to masking mandates. And my friend noted that they also had to cut visits short if the parents weren't cooperative with the masking and social distancing during the visit and all gifts that were brought in had to be disinfected to prevent possible spreading of the virus. And so those are just some of the inequalities and injustices that occurred during the COVID-19 pandemic. so much Alyssa that was a great presentation um does anyone have any questions okay if not we will move right along to our expert interview with Yvette Brendan Unfortunately, Cassandra will not be able to be with us this evening, so I will be having the conversation with Yvette. Um, just a little bit about Yvette before we get started is the Almeda County Public Health Department's Quality Improvement and Accreditation Director, Yvette Brandon, came to ACPHD as a graduate student intern. Her initial work was with ACPHD's community-based initiative, and she subsequently served as a lead liaison for a multi-sector collaborative hosted by the department. As a QIA director, she is continuing her lifelong commitment to advancing the collective aspiration for improved individual and community health. Before joining ACPHD, Ms. Brandon worked with several community-based organizations and public health agencies with an explicit commitment to economic and racial equity. Ms. Brandon completed her undergraduate studies at Mills College and received her master in public health from San Jose State University. Ms. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to add before we jump in? No, um, I just want to um, take a moment to thank you for the invitation. And Alyssa, thank you for having your camera on. We've been in these black boxes for a long time, and, it, and it's, it's nice to see a face on the other end. No pressure for anyone who doesn't want to put their camera on, but I, I like seeing a face and not just talking to myself. Appreciate that. All right, perfect. Then let us get started. 
So based on your experience, how do you feel the pandemic has disproportionately affected certain communities? So I, I feel like it's been appropriate to give you a little bit of background about the place where I work and am from. So I'm in Alameda County, which is in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. The biggest city in our county is Oakland. Um, and we have a very diverse population. Um, we have um, areas that are very, very urban, and then we have areas that are very rural. And the experience that we had in Alameda County, um, you can talk about rates of severe illness, death and hospitalization based on somebody's zip code, depending on where they live in our county in terms of the rates of disease. Um, so the disproportionate impacts are for COVID are the disproportionate impacts that we have with all chronic diseases, illness and death, whether it be intentional um, injury or heart attack or cancer, those that bear the brunt of whatever the illness may be, they look the same. They're black and brown folk primarily who are low income folk, um, people who um, are undocumented. And so um, it was just so pronounced in the COVID experience. So it wasn't like all of a sudden COVID hit and we saw all these other populations that we hadn't been serving for decades on end suddenly emerge um, having the disproportionate impacts. No, it was the same, it was the same census tracts. It was the same zip code where we have had just um, seemingly intractable health inequities in our community. Um, and so I think the, the impact and the one that I don't know, I don't know about in your community, but in ours, we haven't, I don't know if we had a chance to pause and um, mourn the loss of life that has been so devastating. Mm. Um, I don't know of another, or in my lifetime, I know that those who lived through the AIDS pandemic kind of had a similar sensation of entire families and communities being devastated by this illness. And we've just, you know, public health profession has just been scrambling. And we, we haven't really, um, in our community, we haven't had that moment to just say, oh my God, over a thousand people in our community have lost their life to this thing. And there are countless others um, that was mentioned in the presentation, whether it be drug addiction, alcohol addiction, all of those things that were comorbidities, right, for the COVID experience. So we all know that, you know, those rates shot up during um, the height of the COVID pandemic. So that's one. I think the presentation spoke to the others. There's increased economic insecurity, increased housing insecurity. We're in the Bay Area. Housing costs are just crazy. Um, there's increased food insecurity. You know, I'm really fortunate. I could afford to like get shipped or Uber or somebody to bring me groceries for people who don't have that access. What did they do during the pandemic? And so, um, you know, we, we were fortunate to hear, we have a, a relationship with the food bank and we're able to actually make sure that people who um, had a positive test were able to isolate and quarantine and get food. Um, but I think that those things can became much, much more pronounced. But I think my underlying comment is that COVID was um, the, the condition that, sh that put a magnifying glass on the things that we've known as public health professionals for decades. And so, um, and, and although we're in a stage of the pandemic that things are beginning to shift, the recovery from the COVID experience is going to continue to disproportionately impact those communities that carry the highest burden of disease. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that you haven't really noticed any new trends. It's just kind of like what you said, it's uh, been magnified. So now people are more aware of the issues that have already existed in the public health infrastructure. 
I, yes, I think that's accurate. Okay. So what factors have you observed that have affected health equity within the different communities? So I think the social determinants are, you know, I always go back to those. What are the social determinants of health? And so um, I think most pronounced in, in, in our region and our area, it's housing. Housing is such um, an indicator for health outcomes and housing was a huge, um, a lack of affordable quality housing was a, a huge obstacle to traverse. And so I'll, I'll, I'll spend most of my comments talking about that and some of the things we did in our local health department. We actually, um, our board of supervisors, you know, got into action and we, um, we procured a couple of hotels to make sure that people who were unhoused could actually have a safe place to be while they were isolating or quarantining um, with COVID, you know, and there were challenges with that because some people didn't want to go into the hotel, but like there were things that happened, but I think um, the, the factor of not having access to housing was one of the things that became um, more amplified. The other um, thing that, you know, we're facing this, we're, eventually it's going to happen. We Locally, we've had an eviction moratorium. And the, the deadline keeps getting extended, but in, eventually the eviction moratorium is, is going to end. And so all of those folks who haven't been able to pay rent or haven't been able to pay full rent are going, you know, some of them are going to be facing eviction. And we already have um, so many unhoused people in our and families in our population. Um, and so I think that that's the factor that's most pressing for us right now. That's the one where we're really trying to get in front of the tide of folks that we expect to be evicted to make sure that their circumstances don't create even more illness um, and inequity in the way that they're experiencing our safety net system. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question is, what are some of the pitfalls that you've observed? Are there any policies, anything that you observed that you felt exacerbated the inequities that have already existed in the system? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, you know, from a, I think I have to speak about that from a, the perspective of being a public health professional in a local health department serving a, a very large community. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is where your question is pointing, but if where my answer is gonna go. It was so hard at the onset, although our board of supervisors and the other leaders in our community were as agile as they could be, government was a real obstacle um, to us moving quickly to make sure that we can meet the needs of the community. And so just by an example, in order to buy anything, you've got to go, you got to write a board letter, you, you know, you have to do all of these things and we get it, it's public dollars and we have to protect the public's trust. But if you need a mask and it takes you three months to get a check to procure a mask, there are, there are real factors there that we need to deal with. And again, our board of supervisors was very responsive and our leadership was very responsive. And eventually we figured out how to traverse some of those um, those obstacles, but they really stood in our way at the onset. Um, I think in terms of external factors and policies, I think, you know, it was, like I mentioned, there were, um, and I think this is true across the nation, we had different levels of compliance, um, depending on where we were in our community. We have a very high vaccination rate in Alameda County. It's upwards of 80%. Um, however, when the pandemic first struck, there were zip codes and communities that were not experiencing a high burden of disease, and they didn't understand why we were sheltering in place. <laughs> they didn't get it. They were like, nobody I know is sick. Why are you subjecting me these, to these regulations, right? And so really trying to work with the sheriff's office and work with our other partners when there was uneven buy-in 
and uneven um, willingness to enforce some of the things that we were putting out as a public health department. Um, that's, that, that was, that's a tough political nut to crack. And um, I hope we don't have to ever go through that again. Um, I think that it was experienced across the nation, actually experienced across the world, um, how those, um, how the political environment really um, impacted how people responded to the pandemic. So based on what you're saying, what things did you and your board do in order to kind of reduce the amount of time that it took to get the supplies you needed? Or mm -hmm. what were some things that you, what were creative solutions that you took? Yeah. So like I said, eventually we figured out ways to procure things. We either we did it through partners, um, through contractual relationships that we can move more quickly and making sure that we kept our procurement process, the integrity of that in place. Um, that's one example. I gave you another, we actually, you know, we, we made, I think there were two or three hotels that we um, had um, possession of for several months and maybe even a year to make sure that people could house and the unhoused could isolate and quarantine safely. Uh, we created a program where we actually gave money to people. Um, we figured out a way to actually issue checks to individuals who were, um, who were low income or no income um, who were really being hit hard by the impacts of COVID, who were COVID positive, and, make sh and made sure that they, they had resources, they had cash. Uh, we brokered relationships with the food bank. We, you know, the food bank has been a long-term partner of ours, but we really amplified that relationship to make sure that those who were COVID positive and isolating and quarantining could actually get access to food. So, so the, those are some of the programmatic and policy um, uh, um, interventions that we put in place um, so that we could meet the needs um, in a more agile and equitable manner. Okay. So now looking forward, based on your experience, um, what lessons can we learn? You mentioned that um, government was a hurdle that you kind of had to jump over in order to get your needs met. So what lessons do you think we can learn from the response at the onset of the pandemic so that if this were to happen to get again, what would you want to see implemented? Yeah, and so we, we're a department that we have understood for decades now that the public health department cannot, uh, we can't improve health outcomes by ourselves. And so we have a long history of deep partnerships in the communities that we serve. And so one of the things that we have done is we've put in place what we're calling the community coalitions. They're a coalition of multiple organizations that are centered in the places that have most um, inequitable health, com health outcomes. And these are, you know, grandmother and grandfather organizations. These are, they, they've been around a long time. Um, they're trusted by the community. They speak the language of the community. They're often located in the community. And we have figured out a way um, to partner with them to ensure a long-term kind of sustainable response to whatever hits our communities. So, you know, we're in California. We're dealing with COVID now, but we're gonna be dealing with fire soon. We also are a place where we have earthquakes. And so we need relationships, active, formal relationships with a variety of community partners who can be an extension of our, our response arm whenever, not if, but when we're hit with another um, a crisis like this. And so I think the formal structure of coalition contracts is the thing that we're experimenting with right now. You know, we, they haven't been in place very long. It's been about six months. But we're, we're going to be relying on that kind of configuration of a paid formal relationship with community-based organizations, churches, all kinds of different organizations are in the coalition to, um, to be an arm of the response that we have whenever our communities 
are facing an emergency or a hazard. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate um, you being here this evening and sharing a little bit of what you've experienced throughout the pandemic. I'm going to open it up to anyone. If you have any questions at all, feel free to ask. You could type it in the chat as well. We'll give it a couple minutes. And then um, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to our next presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alexis Bridges. I just want to say um, just thank you to Mrs. Yvette for um, sharing um, all of that with us and your experience and giving us some insight. I appreciate it. Well, thanks again for the invitation. I'm glad to have been here. Okay, if there are no other questions, then we will move on to our next presentation. And I will turn it over to Ms. Monroe. I'm here. Okay, hey everybody. It's great to be here. I'm excited to share my passion. So I have been a midwife, a home birth midwife, traditional midwife for 40 years. I'm a doula trainer. So my passion is definitely around reducing infant maternal mortality, particularly the black community. And I wanna talk about how the pandemic really put more of a tax on the, on all, well, really on black women and women of color. It affected um, our outcomes pretty severely. So maternal health means, you know, how do we take care of a pregnant person, a pregnant woman? And that's crucial. I always like to tell families that if we don't uh, take care of the mother, the female, our daughters, we're not gonna have a society. So for me, it's the most important piece that we have to focus on to keep a healthy society because that's where the first teacher we say is the mother, is the parent. So maternal mortality, maternal mortality, morbidity, just a difference. We often talk about the mortality, which is the number of people who died having babies, but we don't often talk about the number of women or birthing people who are long time illnesses from poor outcomes of their pregnancy. And so we know now, well, we found out some years ago that the maternal mortality rate is increasing in the black community. And we found out because when they did research, they found out that the maternal mortality was increasing for white women. And, and while they researched it, realized that for black women, it was three and a half times higher. So right now, the way that we measure maternal mortality is by the number of women who die per 100,000 compared to infant mortality, which is the number of babies born live who die per 1,000. So for every 100,000 uh, deliveries, 23 white will not make it and 55.3 black women will not make it um, from having a child. And what's unfortunate about that is that 60% according to the CDC is preventable. So that's 60% of women uh, birthing people who should be able to live and have their children. And so we look at maternal mortality from the time of conception to 42 weeks after the birth of the child um, is, yeah, is considered, um, they're saying six weeks after the birth of the child. So I'm going to repeat that. So maternal mortality is measured from conception when you get pregnant to up to six weeks after the birth. However, because of the Medicaid expansion and because maternal mortality has made the press now, we have just passed many laws in different parts of the state, but also federally, that now maternal mortality, maternal health will continue for up to one year. 
which brings us to the pandemic. So I'm going to look at the next slide, please. So this just shows us the, uh, the rates of what it looks like in this country. In 2018, we had 17.4 per 100,000, and then we see the 2019, we see the 2020. However, when I do teach these programs about mature mortality and statistics of any time whatsoever, as uh, Ms. Ever was speaking, and Elisa, I hope I'm saying your name correctly, was speaking earlier, when we give these numbers, you have to break it down, unfortunately, and fortunately to, by race, because the pandemic affected Black people um, and other people of color at a much higher negative rate, not because they're Black, not because of the color, as we've heard, because of the social determinants, because of years since enslavement and then being through Jim Crow and then being through other movements, never getting the quality of life. So housing, uh, food deserts, uh, more uh, poor school access to education, poor access to quality food, there is food, all those things over many, many decades make it more difficult for the human body to sustain any kind of illness um, or disease, but the body's designed to fight infection. But if you're already compromised because of a, a, and I didn't even include pollution, you know, all the brown fields where people of color, particularly black folks are stuck living in areas that have a lot of um, pollution. So if you're pregnant and you can't find food and you're stressed because of housing and you can't take a walk because there's no place to walk, there are no parks. So you have to walk too far because there is no bus system depending on where you live. You know, my family's from Alabama we go there for the summer. If you don't have a car, just forget it because you have to, you know, walk really far and at that time to get a Greyhound bus to get into the city or people would hitchhike to get a ride. But nowadays, if you're on the road, no one's picking up hitchhikers anymore. Those days are over. So you're just walking long periods of time in the rural areas uh, to get any type of uh, food or support, things like that. And we know that we have more obstet obstetricians are retiring now and more hospitals in the South and actually nationally are closing down particularly in black communities. So we have less obstetrical midwifery availability for those most in need. So um, I wanna make sure I covered the piece on what is mature mortality. So just to know what that means that anytime you die during pregnancy or up to six weeks after they consider that mature mortality, but we're also pushing that to mean domestic violence um, as well as other things. And the other problem that we have is that for African-American women, we have a, a, longer, a longer range of dying from childbirth. So whereas white America, they, they, their maternal mortality kind of slows down around three months. We have up to a year, mainly because of hypertension and cardiomyopathy. So those are things that continue to plague um, black women to be able to be alive. I just want to stress too that, you know, it's a big deal because this is someone's daughter who's dying. This is a grandbaby that we, we expected to see. And now that grandbaby has no mother. This is our sisters. These are our friends who just, we knew, we just talked to them yesterday, went be happy, had the baby shower and go to have the baby. And then they don't come back home. You know, so it, it really is a big deal that this is happening in our country where we are a superpower. You know, we're in Ukraine. We have all these things, billions of dollars. We can send arms in all over the world, but we can't even keep our citizens alive to bring forth a new life. So we up so the pandemic really showed us how bad we're doing around birth, particularly for black people who choose to have children. And so the next slide, please. And so what we saw, how it even got worse, because already bad. So we've had years of poor infant mortality for the black community and maternal mortality, but it, it got worse when we saw that um, because of the pandemic, women can now no longer go for their prenatal visits. So they have reduced visits. So if you already have health problems or you're, you're more prone to health problems because of social determinants, you need all the more to have regular visits. So those were compromised. So we saw more problems with that. And then we had isolated visits. Usually when you go to prenatal care, you bring your partner or you brought your doula. So, you know, it's a good time that you bring your families. And so a lot of people call and tell me, you know, you know, Shafia, I don't want to go to my prenatal visit because I don't want to go alone. My husband can't come with me. My friend can't come with me. My doula can't come with me. And as, as Alicia mentioned, there's already mistrust anyways for Black folks going to the hospital. So we want somebody there to witness. And on top of that, we know from the media now that having a baby being Black is a, is a risk factor. So the trust is even worse. There's less trust. You, just, you wanted somebody to be with you. 
So a lot of people would not even go because they could not bring a partner. They went reluctantly. And then when they went to have their baby, you know, for many communities, it's a social time, you know, your uncle, people come to the birth room and celebrate this person having a birth. And so the hospitals that didn't shut down, um, they told people that they could only bring one person with them, which meant that if you had a doula with you the whole time, all your nine months you trusted to be with you, then that doula could not come or they had to choose between having their doula, the professional support person and their partner. So that created even more stress for uh, women and pregnant people. And then doulas, which are a person who's been trained professionally to provide support to um, birthing people, a lot of hospitals closed down in the sense that doulas were not considered essential workers, so therefore they could not access their clients. So there's a big breach of trust where somebody has spent almost nine months or 38 gestational weeks creating a relationship and trust with the community person, their doula, and then when it's time to go into the hospital, the policy was now that the doula could not enter or somehow they had to have proof of being vaccinated. It's getting better now, but from 20 to just recently, it was really hard for pregnant women uh, to be left alone with all these things. And then also women were afraid to go in. They didn't want to get exposure to COVID. So they didn't have the protective gear. They didn't have the right type of um, N49 or you know, the hand sanitation. So that just made it extra stressful for them. And by the way, stress increases premature birth and premature birth increases mortality. So um, it's just like a, a spiral. And then what the other part that happened because women were afraid to birth in a hospital, they started having what we call unassisted births, which means that, you know, I am a home birth midwife. So I do home births. I have seven children, they're all born at home. My 11 grandkids, I caught at home. So home birth is a very safe um, option. But to, to be, when we say unassisted, that means you don't have a midwife with you. You don't have a, a doctor with you, a naturopath. You're choosing to do it alone because you can't afford the services of a home birth um, profession, but you're too afraid to go to the hospital because of the, the lack of trust. You can't bring your doula. Maybe a partner can't come just the way they're doing things, you know, people are all masked down. And of course, medical providers should save their life. They should be masked down. But, you know, everyone just, the, the whole energy was so different that women just said, particularly Black women, home birth of Black women increased. It said that I'm not going to go to the hospital because I'm just going to say I'm going to do it by myself. And that's dangerous because most births are problem-free, but you do need someone there in case something doesn't go wrong. That, that increased the, the, the risk level for women of color who were afraid to go to the hospital. And I will go to the next slide, uh, if I can, I'll try to do it. It's not moving. Um, can I get some assistance here? Is that Karen? Can you push a slide for me? Um, about do a benefit? Yeah, well, yeah, the next one, it won't, I can't seem to make it go. Um, does everyone else see the doula benefits slide or did you want to go to the slide after that one? The, yeah, the next one, after this one, after the benefit slide. Okay. Oh, oh no, I'm sorry, I did want the benefit slide. You did move it, sorry. Okay, so I want to talk about the benefits of having a doula, why that was a big deal, how the pandemic affected doulas not being able to be with their client. So that means that a doula at a birth makes the labor shorter. So now we have people who are by themselves in the hospital longer with the longer labor, which means more exposure and more stress for that person who's having their baby. Also, doulas prevent medical intervention. So less things are done to a pregnant woman when she's in labor that prevents things like maternal mortality, which by the way, has increased. So we're now at 55.3, as I mentioned, per 100,000 in 2020, when it was, um, what was it in 2019? It was 17 per, 19 per 100,000. So now we have more medical interventions, we have a increase in cesarean section. 
And cesarean section also contributes to a higher maternal mortality and also a higher morbidity. Cesarean sections are great when you need them, but one out of three American women are getting cesarean sections. And what they did during the pandemic, they started inducing people and scheduling cesarean sections, but people didn't need them because they, the doctors wanted, because they were backed up. They just wanted to get things right. They, they probably felt like they were doing the right thing, but they weren't. So that means we had an increase of saving sections for folks who did not need it due to the pandemic. So that was definitely a, uh, a negative or an inequity in that disparity as well. And then um, we know that breastfeeding is going to give babies that good start in life and doulas help increase breastfeeding the first hour. So now we have moms in the hospital room by themselves with um, no one to support them in breastfeeding. So maybe they got help from breastfeeding, maybe not. And here's the issue is that we know that there was already a shortage. You know, unfortunately, many health professionals actually passed away doing their job. So, you know, really a moment of silence for them. And then also we know that many left because they were exhausted or, or, the, or they got sick themselves. So we're already short staff. So by not having that doula there to help that person begin their breastfeeding, reduce breastfeeding rates in the black community. And also, uh, there's less use of having epidurals during labor by having a, a doula, which means they have a fast recovery. You don't have medication, your body jumps back quicker. And then of course, uh, less NICU time if babies are going full term. So by having access to the doula, um, thanks Yvette, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I took your number, I'm gonna call you. So, so we'll have uh, less NICU time if we have reduced premature births. And then my last slide, which is here, thank you so much. It just shows um, how the rates have changed. If I have this correctly, this is actually a racial uh, slide. And so the blue one is showing us the maternal mortality rate for African-Americans is, um, you know, constantly is higher it says, yeah, by race, ethnicity. We don't see it on the bottom. I don't see it anyways, but you might see it. It tells you how African-Americans or Black Americans or Black people have consistently had, have had a higher rate of maternal mortality. And that rate has gone up by 14% since COVID. So it was, um, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna say that it was, it's, it's higher than it was before uh, because of course so it's, it's, it's risen by 14%. So we have uh, 863 people who died having babies um, this year because of COVID. So the pandemic has definitely affected maternal health in terms of the depression, as someone mentioned, the isolation, you know, being home by yourself, being pregnant, locked in, being afraid for yourself, and now you're also afraid for your unborn, uh, not able to access the hospital as easily. Everything was uh, tele telehealth, taking your own blood pressure. You know, a lot of things are sent to women now doing their own care as opposed to going in and having the prenatal care. You know, having to go alone for your prenatal visit, can't bring anybody with you, having to birth alone. So all that, and then having increased cesarean sections with stress in, in the health healthcare environment has increased the deaths of black women. And that, that death rate continues to increase to this day. It hasn't stopped, it's still, it's still high, it's still spiraling. So definitely something needs to be done. There are some bills that are out, but you know it's gonna, it's gonna take a minute. Uh, some hospitals have allowed doulas to come back into the hospital. So um, pretty much I hope that in time that we'll see a difference, that maternal health will be fair for all people and that some won't suffer based on their ethnicity not to live to bring to be home with their babies. So the baby's alive and the mom's not. You know, we got fathers and grandparents raising, you know, five-day-old babies and six-month-old babies because the mother, you know, died in childbirth, either on the table or they found her dead, you know, in the in the room. She had a stroke from undetected preeclampsia. And for a lot of these women, they call the hospital and say, you know, I have headaches. You know, they gave the sign. I have a headache. I don't feel right. This spots in front of my eyes. I'm having a stomach ache. These are all the diagnosed, documented um, symptoms. And they were like, you know, for Black women, you know, oh, you just probably just stress from the baby, you know, rest. But they needed to be hospitalized. And so this is documented again. 
CDC said that 60% of these deaths are preventable. And these same deaths that we see for black women from the pandemic were not seen for white women. Their maternal mortality rate has pretty much stayed stationary and now it's continues to decline. So with that said, I'm gonna end my presentation. Thank you all for, um, for being a part of this. And any questions? Um, I actually had a question for you. So during the pandemic, how did you support your clients with all the restrictions that were um, around? Well, as, as a home birth midwife, I still went to the home, you know, asked the family to make sure that they were practicing social distancing. We had to all agree to um, wear masks during the visits. I actually, you know, delivered babies at the house still. And the family would wear masks up for the mom. We wore masks and so much, you know, so far that was okay. We supported people emotionally. They could call in and talk about their tele, you know, the telehealth. We gave them questions to ask. Um, to make them feel more empowered. If they didn't feel like they were getting uh, good care, we helped them decide who should go with you, the doula or the family member, so that maybe the partner wouldn't feel left out. Sometimes the partner say, hey, you know, I want the doula to go. So we just helped them to navigate that way, make sure that they were as stress-free as possible, you know, basic drinking water, you know, getting their vitamin D, taking the C, uh, and just, you know, demanding to be seen. I said, you know, if you don't feel right, don't do telecommunication, just, actually go in, tell them that you want to be seen. If you, say, if you say you want to be seen, they'll see you. If you don't say it, they're not gonna say it. So we would tell our clients to say, I need a physical appointment or I'm going to the ER. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anyone else, any questions? Well, thank you for offering this opportunity. Uh, this is this is great. So thank you for inviting me. And again, it's a privilege to be able to share my perspective around maternal health. We truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph. I'm, I'm really, um, I don't really have a question. I just want to say um, thank you for all you do and um, just keep up the good work. Thank you. Okay. And our next presentation will be Dr. Alex Adjung. So I will turn it over to you to talk about the impact on global maternal and newborn health outcomes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, actually, from Virginia. Um, thank you so much for the invite. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, and I've really appreciated the presentation from, you know, the, the previous presenters from Alisa talking about, like, the impact of COVID-19 um, much more broadly to events. Uh, presentation on just um, the response from the county department health and also just want to celebrate the work you do, Shafia. Hearing you say that you gave birth to, um, or you delivered, or you were there for the births of all of your 11 grandchildren, that's really, <laughs> I just want to say thank you for that. Um, thank you, thank you. I'm bringing an added perspective to COVID-19 as we talk about its impact globally. Um, so I work with the American Academy of Pediatrics um, as the director of global training and implementation. So a lot of our work is really for the global audience. Next slide, please. Um, so just this is an overview of what I'll be talking about for the next 10 minutes. Um, it's give you an overview of the American Academy of Pediatrics, some stats on the background of global newborn health, um, the impact of COVID-19 on global newborn health, and it's a perfect lead up to Shafia's presentation on maternal mortality health, um, and then talk about some of the innovations that we, we either collaborated with other partners on or led during um, the COVID-19. So the mission of the American Academy of Pediatrics is to attain optimal physical, mental, and social health and well-being for all infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. So the AP was launched 19 years ago, and it's a member-led organization. But in that 90 years, the work of the AP has evolved where it hasn't just focused on US-based children, but on children all over the globe. Next slide, please. 
And we do a lot of our work based on three pillars, on policy, um, advocacy, and education. So policy, the AAP writes a lot of guidelines and policy on pediatric health in general. You probably see a lot of things in publication that talks about AAP's um, recommendations on things like masking in schools or immunizations for uh, pediatric populations or anything that it relates to health, um, physical, mental, mental um, or social or otherwise. The AAP also um, so works with a lot of um, federal organizations to advocate for health care for children and children's rights, not just in the US, but globally as well. And then lastly, the AAP through um, its members and its technical experts offers a lot of education and training programs to pediatricians, pediatric providers, again, not just in the US, but across the world as well. Next slide, please. Um, so actually before this slide, I don't know if the poll is going to work. So Karen, maybe this will be a time to pull up the poll questions. So hopefully you all can see the screen. Um, and the question is how many babies um, are born every year worldwide? Give about 10 more seconds for responses. Can we pull up the next question, please? Oh, okay, so we'll just go through our responses. So actually 88% said 130 million, and that is correct. Yes, about 130 million babies are born worldwide. Next question. We'll give another 10 seconds for responses. This is actually interesting. So majority of respondents said 1.6 million. Um, nobody said 3.8 million. The answer is actually 2.4 million. So 2.4 million babies um, die yearly um, after birth. So then this brings us to some of the facts. Um, as you see on the slide, approximately 130 million babies are born worldwide every year. And then just leveraging the stats that um, Shafia had, uh, Ms. Shafia had previously shared, 810 women approximately die every day from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And we talk about all the um, disparities um, here in the US, but interestingly, when we look at it from a global perspective, about 94% of those deaths occur in low and lower middle income countries in the world. I have this in red just because again, our focus is really on newborn health, but 2.4 million babies die in the first four weeks of life, and which approximates to about 6,700 newborn deaths per year. And when we expand it to include stillbirths, it's actually 5.1 million. And about 99% of that occurs in low and middle income countries, just for perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just to show the disparity across um, the globe as it relates to newborn mortality. And as you know, it's um, expressed as the number per thousand live births. So the, um, the recommended or what everyone is striving for with like the sustainable development goals, ETC, is to be less than 12 per thousand live births. And then from the graph um, on the map, and this is by the um, UN Interagency Group for Child Mortality Estimation, you would actually see the region of the world with the darker blue shadings that have higher newborn mortality rates. And of course, you see the color in the US. So whilst overall the US has less than 12 um, newborn mortality rates per 100,000 live births, when you then look at the 
data and then you dis, um, you aggregate the data, then that's where you see the disparities within different ethnic um, groups. But then globally, um, countries in mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, parts of um, Asia and then the Middle East actually have larger than 25 newborn mortality rates per 100,000 live births. So again, just showing you um, the disparities that exist worldwide. Next slide. Um, so as you probably heard, you heard of the sustainable development goals, um, the millennium development goals who were in, that were initially um, adapted at the turn of the millennium and were supposed to have created targets by 2015. By the time the United Nations group saw that we weren't necessarily getting to that um, goals, then they developed the sustainable development goals. And the target is actually to reduce newborn mortality rates by 2030 to less than 12. Now, the World Health Organization has a technical working group called the um, Every Newborn Action Plan. Um, and then they even further developed another target that is um, another goal, which is further again reducing newborn mortality rates, but then with a target date of 2035. And this is even more relevant now just because of the impact of the pandemic. And as you see, even though globally since 1990, when even the concept of millennium development goals were developed, there has been a decline in newborn mortality rates as well as under five mortality rates. It's still not at the rate that will get to the desired goals. Um, and this graph from the Every Newborn Action Plan just shows that if business continues as usual with the downward trend, we would not meet, um, achieve the goal, but in order to achieve the goal, then we have to accelerate progress. One, not just to, um, to catch up from the impact of COVID, but also to ensure that uh, the work is targeting those countries and also even within countries, those regions where there's huge disparities in the outcomes. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a slide from the SDGs UN that gives an overview of the overall impacts of COVID. And Alisa had shared this globally and then as it impacts US addressing all the social determinants of health and everything. But then here we talk about health systems and then also the outcomes. So as you see here, uh, when we focus on um, sustainable development goal three, which is ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages, you see that the pandemic either halted or reversed progress in health, and it also shortened life expectancy. 90% of countries are still reporting one or more disruption to health services. And we heard in depth from the um, previous um, presentations about the impact that COVID pandemic has had on hospital visits, increase in cesarean sections, we talked about mental health, but globally, a lot of countries have actually reported huge, um, declines in goals or even a reversal of goals um, overall with significant disruptions to essential health services. And essential health services is your basic, not specialized service, access to medicines, access to birthing centers, and then access to um, life-giving procedures. Um, and then one thing that has also been measured by the UN is that a decade of progress could be stalled or reversed by the COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes in reproductive health, in maternal health and in child health. So imagine what a decade of progress will do to those numbers that we shared previously, 6,700 newborns dying every day. One thing also the pandemic has also um, brought or exacerbated is a lack of data, which continues to hinder an understanding of the true impact of the pandemic. And I believe Alicia had mentioned it previously, where she said there was under-reporting in certain uh, facilities, states. Some people were also, um, there was a lot of controversy. Some people also said there was over-reporting because everything was counted at COVID deaths. But either way, the data isn't necessarily saying the picture and the true impact of COVID might be much more than is reported. Um, and then even again, when we now talk about the global um, scope is countries with death registration systems with less, uh, barely had 75% um, completion. So again, a lot of countries, when you think about the globe, have lack of accurate data or um, systems not necessarily established to measure birth and death registration. So you can actually imagine how the impact will be when, when eventually we get out of this um, pandemic, who only, and only God knows when that will be. 
And then for universal health coverage, um, scaling up investment in universal health coverage is essential because one of the things that I think the COVID pandemic showed us with health systems, it, it exposed to fault lines within health systems. People couldn't get access to vaccines. People couldn't get access to community-wide testing. And all of that is really hinged on an effective universal health coverage that believes that everybody should have access to the basic and essential health services in a population. And then we then talk about healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are in short supply in many regions of the world. And this has been further stretched by limits. Um, this has been further stretched to the limits by the pandemic. And I know um, Shafia had mentioned previously that you know, either healthcare workers were burnt out or they were dying themselves from COVID. And this is also true even more on the global scene where there was health worker shortage before. And then just talking about nurses and midwives, because that's the core group that um, tend to be birth attendants. When you compare to Northern America, which includes the US, you have an average of about 100 and 50 healthcare workers per 10,000 population. And this is still not adequate, especially when you disaggregate the data by communities and rural and urban settings. But then in a lot of low and middle income countries using Sub-Saharan Africa as a case study, you have less than 10 per 10,000 people. Again, with just this shortage that was already there before COVID, then you had healthcare workers dying, then you had healthcare workers being burnt out or lack of access to basic services, lack of access to personal protective equipment. Healthcare workforce was even further shortened by the um, pandemic. Next slide, please. One more thing that was reported with COVID-19 and the impact is what we call excess mortality. And the term global um, GNCAH just means global newborn child and adolescent health. So this talks about um, infants, from zero um, that's at birth up until the 24 years of age. And the graph shows you countries when you see excess um, negative, and that's the teal, greenish teal color. It's actually telling you the number of countries that reported excess mortality for the different age groups. And you see that the larger bucket, which is the bluish purple that says none, is there wasn't necessarily a change in the mortality rates with few countries saying there was actually a downward um, change, meaning there was progress in those mortality rates. So it's interesting that the bulk of the data either says there was no change or there was excess mortality. So if we look at that fundamental um, that was shared previously that there was uh, problems with data collection or accurate data systems. So a lot of the non could actually tend towards excess mortality. And then excess mortality just means because of the disruption in essential health services and everything else that we've talked about, the impact of COVID, you've had this increase in mortality more than um, had been previously reported. And those, that, um, that overall stats that says, you know, there probably will be like a decade of reversal in newborn or just even overall health mortality indices. Next slide, please. So it's not all doom and gloom with COVID, even though it's unfortunate that we've you know, had loss of lives, COVID has also allowed for innovations, especially for organizations that were flexible, were nimble, and had a lot of work um, in, again, low and middle income countries already working towards trying to stretch programs or focus on health system strengthening. And at the American Academy of Pediatrics, again, leveraging the three pillars of policy, advocacy, and education, we're able to um, respond to COVID-19. One, partnering with the American Heart Association that we already um, do to conduct like our advanced pediatric advanced life support courses or our pediatric advanced life support courses. We're able to quickly bring up policies and guidelines on our newborn resuscitation program and strategies for teaching during COVID-19. We're also able to quickly put out policies and guidelines on delivery room and neonatal resuscitation in the context of COVID. We also released a lot of interim guidelines for basic and advanced life support in children and neonates with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Next slide. Um, something else we did, especially in terms of um, our global training programs, is as we were faced with the challenges of the pandemic, it disrupted traditional learning where we had to fly not just equipment, but trainers to um, resource limited settings. One of our flagship programs, which is helping babies survive programs, is usually delivered in person. 
But because of the impact of COVID-19, all of those trainings had to stop. Health systems were overburdened. There were travel restrictions, social distance policies, which didn't necessarily allow for people to gather together for trainings and skills building. Um, and then it also was allowed for it didn't necessarily allow for a maintaining of training and skills, um, especially in the provision of newborn and child health and um, maternal health. So then what we then did was we created innovative digital solutions that were then necessary to ensure that healthcare workers continue to be trained and equipped to support births. Next slide, please. And this innovation in our newborn training programs is um, we worked with Little Global Health um, to launch free digital training materials that ensured educational continuity. So our course, Essential Newborn Care Now, is a digital training package that supports the um, remote facilitation of the recently released World Health Organization Essential Newborn Care Program. This uses an online platform. It allows providers to learn and practice key course objectives in a safe and effective way, especially where gathering in person is limited. And the thing about this innovation, please go to the next slide, is it also allowed for education to expand beyond a typical traditional classroom setting. So people that were in rural and peri-urban areas that had to rely on traveling to the city centers for trainings could have the trainings done remotely at their place of practice. And this is some of the um, equipment and tools that we developed in collaboration with our partners. Um, we already had new Natalie Life, which is at um, training mannequin for newborn health, but to the far right is a new Natalie Life system, which incorporates Bluetooth and then it can collect skills practice in real time to an app and then as well to a software system. We launched um, the learning materials on hmbs.org and then we also um, launched digital training assessment tools. Next slide, please. Um, and then this picture just shows you our traditional Helping Babies Breed training program. This was a couple of years ago, somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa and the training to date, this was for a group in Nepal. So we had instructors, um, implementers and um, administrators from different countries and different states within US um, that were supporting the training of healthcare workers in a hospital in Nepal. Interestingly, I actually stayed up from like 12 midnight to 4 a.m. Um, to participate in these trainings, but that was something where we would have had to pay thousands of dollars and flights to just go support the training anyway. So that was one of our COVID-19 innovations. We also supported a lot of um, using enhanced um, digital tools. So using virtual reality, um, using a lot of simulation and virtual simulation products. Um, we also supported, um, there's this um, learning methodology called ECHO, uh, or Project ECHO, which is Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. So it's a telemetry approach where you can have providers in a central hub that then work with providers in spokes and it can be as far as anywhere. So here is uh, one of the flyers where we were working on um, learning sessions for pediatric subspecialties in COVID with the Pediatric Association of Nigeria. And all of it was done virtually and remotely. Um, so that's just a summary of the impact of COVID-19, especially narrowing it down to newborn care, um, and then what the AP was able to do in response to COVID-19. Any questions? I have a question. Thank you. That was a, a great presentation. And I want to ask you about what's happening with promoting, um, how is the breastfeeding rate going in the global world? And mm -hmm. is it lasting for at least 24 months? That's a great question. And it's interesting you actually talk about breastfeeding because um, you've probably heard the concept of reverse innovation where um, solutions are brought from the field or from quote and unquote low and middle income countries or the third world and they're brought into um, the developed world. So yes, the concept of kangaroo mother care and early initiation of breastfeeding is what the World Health Organization and several governments in low and middle income countries continue to encourage, not just because of the health benefits, but even for cost reasons. Formula right. is very, very expensive. Um, so 
um, that is highly encouraged. So yes, breastfeeding, especially early initiation of breastfeeding continues to be advocated for in low and middle income countries. It is, and the concept of exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months is highly um, recommended. And there are a lot of policies that you know, support that early breastfeeding. But as you know, a lot of it is also tagged on the nutritional status of both the mother and the baby. So mm. all of that has to be done in concession with any health system strengthening efforts. Um, traditionally, especially that winning period, a lot of cultures in like Sub-Saharan Africa, maybe Asia and the Middle East encourage that winning period of about 18 months. Uh, but for as many people as can afford it, pediatricians and other healthcare providers encourage breastfeeding for, there's this concept called the first thousand days. But okay. now as people have to go back to the workforce with increased women working in the workforce, some of that is not necessarily feasible. Hence that call focus on exclusive breastfeeding for six months at least. Thank you. And I know that in the United States, we're very much behind Breastfeeding World Health Organization, but I'm in Oregon and we just passed some bills where women have the right to pump at work and by law have a refrigeration place to keep the milk so they can get back home for the baby. So they're at least getting human milk. My other question was, I know that, um, you know, I commend everything that's going on. I think it's great that we're seeing all this good work, but just being a midwife, I know there was a lot of work around the continent of Africa. I can't speak of the other uh, continents, but they were, um, well, there's two schools, depending on what part of Africa you're in, but are we, are we looking at the traditional birth attendants? Are we retraining them as community health workers slash doulas, whatever term we want to use to help them to uh, meet the need? Because we know that the women often have a very far travel to get to the city. So is there anything happening in the rural area with the, with the traditional birth attendants? Yes, um, and that's a great question. Thank you for bringing that up. So for us, especially from the AP global health perspective, we count traditional birth attendants also as birth attendants. Hence, we use the term globally birth attendants. So okay. this includes skilled professionals like nurses and midwives, as well as traditional birth attendants. Just because like you mentioned, a lot of births are actually done in the home setting or the community setting. So right. we have to then invest a lot of resources in training the traditional birth, um, birth attendants so that then they can also um, identify a baby who needs help breathing at birth or identify an at-risk mother and send to a facility early enough or identify complications as it happens. Now that cannot be done in silo just like you just like you said previously because it's all about the system. So right. in essence the traditional birth attendant should also be should uh, as we're training the traditional birth attendants, we're also working to make sure that there's a good referral system. So when the traditional birth attendants does identify a case that is complex and has to be taken care of outside of the home setting or the community setting, then right. you're able to transport the woman. I'll give an example of when I was um, working as a young medical officer in a remote area in Nigeria where, I, where I'm from and I trained and I was called to um, help we um, deliver the placenta of a woman who had just been given birth to. And then we get there, there's no blood bank in the facility. We didn't even have electricity. We didn't mm. have a van. There was no means of transportation. And mm. we told the relatives, we're like, well, you have to go to the city, which was about maybe 40 minutes next. And they were like, there's just nowhere. And they weren't going anywhere. Right. So, um, I did what I probably wouldn't do again um, in my lifetime and just started talking on the placenta and was praying and hoping for, you know, it to come up. I don't know what the long term, because you had brought, um, you brought up a very great concept where we all focus on the mortality aspect of it, but we forget about the morbidity. Right. I have no clue what happened to that woman long term and if she experienced any morbidity from that childbirth experience and that unconventional method of trying to you know, deliver the placenta afterwards. But the point I'm just making is the health has to be looked at, not just at the healthcare worker setting, but then it's like, is there a good referral system? Do you have access to blood banks? Do you have access mm -hmm. to essential medicines? And can you provide holistic care when it's needed? And that's why there is a huge focus on universal health care where everybody regardless of where they are should have access to basic health services exactly. and that's a long-winded answer to your question but hopefully no that that was great i want to ask you this last part so did the placenta come out from the prayer it did it did yes i knew it did i didn't want to say 
So we have something in common. After, before manual uh, extraction, we want to try the prayer first. So right on. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Yes, we did. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right, thank you all so much. Um, I know for me personally, I have gained so much from listening to all of you. So I cannot thank you enough for participating and presenting, Alyssa, Yvette, Shafia, Maimunat, like just thank you so much. I appreciate you all for all the hard work that you put into all of your presentations. Um, so you. just looking ahead for tomorrow, um, tomorrow is going to be our words of wisdom with our alumni. So we have a couple graduates of the MPH program with Benedictine who are gonna be sharing about their experiences in the pandemic, as well as how they got into the careers that they currently have. So once again, I wanna thank all of our presenters for being here this evening, and I wanna thank you all for attending, and we will see you tomorrow. <laughs>